Hi there, my name is Adam Waters, and I'm the lead pastor here at Grace Bible Church in Elmhurst, Illinois. I'm just so glad that you made the decision to take us along with you this week on life's journey. Here at Grace Bible Church, we are a family of faith who seeks forgiveness, healing, and hope in Jesus Christ. Now, we might all come from different backgrounds, but each of us recognize that the tremendous needs in our lives point us to one place, to God, for His answers, His provision, and mostly, for His grace. I hope the following program gives you a new perspective on who God is, who you are, and how you too might find forgiveness, healing, and hope in our Lord Jesus. Thanks for listening. Today, our scripture is, um, we're still in Mark, and we are in chapter 6, verses 1 through 6. I'm reading from the NIV. Jesus left there and went to his hometown, accompanied by his disciples. When the Sabbath came, he began to teach in the synagogue, and many who heard him were amazed. Where did this man get these things? They asked. What's this wisdom that has been given to him? What are these remarkable miracles he's performing? Isn't this the carpenter? Isn't this Mary's son and the brother of James, Joseph, Judas, and Simon? Aren't his sisters here with us? And they took offense at him. Jesus said to them, A prophet is not without honor except in his own town, among his relatives, and in his own home. He could not do any miracles there except lay his hands on a few sick people and heal them. He was amazed at their lack of faith. Then Jesus went around teaching from village to village. Probably back in August, we we started negotiations in our household about when um, the Christmas tree would go up. So I think it was probably August 15th or so, Shannon was convinced, insistent that we put it up on August 16th. She said every day is Christmas Day and we should be celebrating like it's Christmas every day. But maybe you're like me, you know, it's like it's a special protected time of year when the songs come on. It it gives us this feeling of nostalgia. And I think that while Shannon was excited for that day, she was ushering it in perhaps a little bit too quickly. So we get to September. When we're putting the Christmas tree up, Shannon, relax. We're going to get the Christmas tree up. We're going to smell potpourri. It's going to be beautiful lights. It's going to be awesome. October comes around. Let's renegotiate our Christmas tree. How about after Halloween? The day after Halloween. Well, it's supposed to be the day after Thanksgiving, traditionally, many of you know. And so we finally settled on the day after Halloween. Well, Halloween night rolls around. It's about 6 o'clock. She says, Halloween's over. It's no longer Halloween, so now we can put our Christmas tree up. So about August, or on October 31st, by about 6.30, we had our Christmas tree up, started listening to Christmas music, the whole deal. And it's been wonderful. I'm not denying. It's, it's been really good. One of the things that I love, and I think that our family really embraces about Christmas, is the idea of family, the idea of being together with those we love, the feeling of sort of coziness, you know what I mean? Like the smell of... Um, evergreens, pine, Christmas time, presents, the time of togetherness. But for some of you, perhaps many of you, and for many of the friends with whom I interact, holidays can be a very difficult time. In fact, uh, I belong to a, a group, a, a recovery group, in which we put meetings on 24 hours a day for the holidays of Thanksgiving. And Christmas. Uh, I've gone to some of these meetings, sometimes late. It's kind of fun, you know. It's like Christmas morning, 3 a.m. I'm going to go to a meeting, and I'm going to see who's there. And it's packed. It's packed with people. When you start listening to their stories and hearing what they're saying, they're saying things like, I could only make it till like 10.30 before my mother said something. I got together with my brother. We've been beefing for years and years, but I know I had to go because it's Christmas, it's the right thing to do, but I just can't deal with him. The things that he says to me. Or often we hear, my family still treats me like I'm who I used to be. And so for many people, holidays is a very difficult time. They're a very difficult time. It's interesting to me and it's comforting to me to know that Jesus dealt with much of this same thing with his own family and friends in his town of, of Nazareth. You know, family and friends can be often the hardest to reach, too, aren't they? When we're believers in the Lord and we want to share what we found. 
in our Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. We want to share what it's like to live in His grace, to be filled with the Holy Spirit, to share what we've learned about how life used to be and how life is now. Yet all those memories of who we were, and oftentimes, sadly, the things we did, the things we said, come back to haunt us later on, even though we are seeking to live a different life. Nevertheless, we must represent Christ in a winsome and loving way to those in our family who have a difficult time hearing the truth from little old us. We need to get our heads around this for this holiday, especially because I think what happens is, in this world we're in, I mean, we see how contentious it is. You know, I, I see posts on social media all the time where it's like, this person's a conservative, and they say that I'm going to immediately, the first thing at dinner, I'm going to talk about Trump. And it's like, bam, it's going to turn into an argument. Or the person who's super progressive says, the first thing I'm going to talk about is whatever, and it, it, I'm going to create tension on purpose. And they're making light of it. The truth is, is that this is what's actually happening. So what do we do? One option is to say nothing and ignore the situation, ignore our family, ignore everything regarding, except the turkey. Great turkey. Weather's beautiful outside. Another option is to form a resentment and create that us and them thing. You know what I mean. They'll always be that way. Or I can't say anything to them. Or we're nice to them on the outside, but on the inside we're seething or irritated with everything that they say. Or we judge them. Perhaps the worst piece is creating walls that block communication later on. The truth is, is we have no idea what our life will bring us or how God is going to use any circumstance in our life. And the very person who we believed would never be the person who would see the light is the one who sees it the very next day. We can get in the way of what God is doing by creating walls and breaking down communication with those who interact with us differently or in a difficult way or those who fail to take us seriously, or our faith. I hear about this all the time. I just want my kid to know the Lord. So we push, and we push, and we push, and what we're pushing is them away. We need to know how to deal with this. This is something of an ironic text that we're speaking about today, because two, or last week we talked about uh, the demon-possessed man. And what did Jesus tell the demon-possessed man at the end after he extra exercises his demons? He says, go home and tell your family everything that the Lord has done for you. Here, we see Jesus doing that exact same thing, going to his own family and telling them about the Lord, and we see the rejection of Jesus. I believe there's principles here in this text, this very short passage that will guide us in our interaction this year. And it, I, t I framed it in the sense of holidays, but the truth is, is we should be doing this every single day of the year. This is the way we should be approaching those in our lives who are acquainted with the, shall I say, old us. So let's turn to Mark 6, chapter, uh, chapter 6, verses 1 through 6. This is how it starts. Jesus left there and went to his hometown accompanied by his disciples. So he's in Nazareth. When Sabbath came, he began to teach in the synagogue, and many um, who heard him were amazed. Now, Nazareth was this little small, it wasn't a very big town at all. It's in the, it's in the Galilee, which is in the north of Israel. Um, it's probably about 60 miles, maybe. I could be wrong on that. Don't, don't quote me. About 60 miles from Jerusalem. It's in northern Israel. It was the area of Israel that had been taken first by the Assyrians in 722 B.C., the Assyrians came, took the people out, transferred new people in, and it became this sort of hodgepodge. In the Old Testament, in the book of Isaiah, it's called Galilee of the Gentiles. So there's not a very huge Jewish population here. So those who were Jewish in this area had a synagogue and they were close-knit. Suffice it to say, everyone probably knew everyone. And they most certainly knew Jesus. So Jesus gets up on the Sabbath and he begins to speak. And the word for amazed here is probably better translated something like dumbfounded. Dumbfounded. They can't believe the things that are coming out of the mouth of this man. It's this kid, I remember when he was this big. And now here he stands with no warning in our synagogue declaring the things of God. And they were dumbfounded. It is here that the Nazarenes in the synagogue that day begin their litany of questions, really their doubts. They say, where did this man get these things? What is this wisdom that has been given to him? What are these remarkable miracles he is performing? Now, imagine, these seem like reasonable questions. Imagine you for a moment are sitting in the synagogue that day. 
And one of the kids who runs, who just stomped out here, one of the kids who just stomped out, he's in the church, he lives his whole life here, he's a good guy, maybe he's an electrician. And one day he gets up and asks to speak. And he declares the most profound message that you have ever heard. And not only on top of that does he declare the things of God, he can back it up with works. Maybe he heals one of the people in our church. Maybe he heals a few of the people in our church who've had a stubborn illness or been tormented by some spiritual oppression. And here's this guy we've known all our life, gets up and he does these amazing things. I love their question. It's like a typical American question. What are your credentials? What are your credentials? When I go through uh, and I look at, I have this sort of thing that I do I admit, I'm a glutton for punishment. That punishment, i.e. education. I go through and I look at different colleges and I say, oh, I could do this degree from this college. Or I could go here and do this degree from this college. And I have to admit, a part of me, when I'm looking at the college, asks myself, what will people think if this is the school I have my degree from? I know a lot of you know what I'm talking about. They ask, what are your credentials? How do you do these things? What is the source of your wisdom? We were unaware that you had worked with anybody who was a rabbi. You didn't sit at the feet of another rabbi. You didn't learn wisdom as in a disciple from some rabbi. You didn't go to some school. What is the source of your wisdom? And then they ask the source of his power. How is it that he does these things? What's remarkable is they don't even deny the miraculous fact of the deed. They don't say, well, it's not a miracle, or he has a trick up his sleeve, or it's all an optical illusion. They're watching these things happen. I think it's interesting here. What I think they're doing is they're implying, perhaps, we see it elsewhere, that Jesus is using an evil power to accomplish what he's accomplishing. Elsewhere in the scripture, we see them accuse him of casting out demons by the name of Satan. And Jesus goes on and says, the kingdom divided against itself, go on and so forth. So here they're questioning his purest of motives, the source of his power, and the source of his wisdom. You know, people even today are not incapable of such horrifically incorrect views of who Jesus is. Spend time on social media, and you'll see some unbelievable things. Unbelievable things. They accused Christ perhaps, of evil, even in the face of healing somebody. And they begin the distancing. If you notice the words, he says, where did this man, where did this guy get this? This is Jesus. He grew up with them. They know him. Maybe even had a nickname. I don't know what it would be. Yeshua is how you say it in Aramaic and Hebrew. Yeshi. This is Yeshi. This is Yeshi, yet he he does and says these things. How is it that he does this? Now it's this man. Verse 3, isn't this the carpenter? Isn't this Mary's son, the brother of James and Joseph and Judas and Simon? Aren't his sisters here with us? And they took offense at him. Offense. Just as Jesus' relatives use their knowledge of him to be an obstacle to their faith, just like our friends and family often do the same to us. And this is the first principle for this morning. Friends and family sometimes use their knowledge of us to dismiss the knowledge in us. They know who we are. They've lived with us. They've seen our mistakes. They've seen us grow up. Oftentimes they don't take us seriously just because where we fall in the pecking order. I hear it all the time. I'm the youngest. I'll always be the youngest. When everyone gets together, you know, we're all in our 50s and 60s. I'm still the little kid. They dismiss their knowledge. The knowledge, they use their knowledge of us to dismiss the knowledge in us. They considered it his vocation. They said, isn't this the carpenter? Now, this isn't necessarily a shot. They're not taking aim at his work. A carpenter at the time, the words tecton, was somebody who worked in all sorts of building fields, most often actually stone. And it was a respectable job. It was something that fathers were intended to teach their sons. It was a passed down trade. So there was nothing in the sense that he was a carpenter in itself that was something that they were um, dismissing. But it's about the body of knowledge. They're saying he's a carpenter. He knows carpentry. He doesn't know the things of Torah. He doesn't understand. How is it that he does these things? It'd be like taking, I don't know, legal advice from a doctor. Probably not a good idea. 
Sorry, John and John. They looked at his family. Isn't this the carpenter? Mary's son? They listed off his brothers and sisters. It's interesting, his brothers and sisters didn't believe in him at first either. But they point to his family. People often do that, don't they? They judge us based on our family one way or another. I feel bad for Calvin sometimes because he's the pastor's son. He should know better. I feel sorry for my brothers and sisters because that's Adam's family. And the apple doesn't fall far from the tree, does it? It's something that we talk about, we live in, we know, we do it implicitly, secretly in our hearts, even though we don't want to say it or recognize it. We associate people in our life, us, with our, with our family, and we link them. I think this is, <laughs> oftentimes, some of us struggle with family who are having a hard time. Maybe they've done something, and we don't want to talk about it. We don't want to talk about it, because how it might reflect on us. If you look at the word and what he says, it calls him the son of Mary. This is pretty interesting. This is something that I had not thought about before. I sort of got a clue in a commentary here, but this is really, I think there's really something to this. In Jewish tradition, in the way you would have done it in Israel at the time, and you can see it in the Old Testament, when you refer to somebody, it's the son of the father. Very rarely is it listed as the son of the mother, unless there's some theological reason to do this. So they might say the son of you know, Rahab. Rahab plays such a big story um, in the book of Joshua. They, so she comes out, right? But here, this is Mary, the son of Mary. What I think these people are doing is alluding to the circumstances of Jesus' birth. Consider yourself the average Nazarene for a moment. And here's this little girl, Mary. She's probably 12 or 13. She is betrothed to Joseph and suddenly winds up pregnant. Now, a couple of questions. Did Joseph do something he wasn't supposed to do? Did Mary participate in a way she should not have participated? Joseph threatens to divorce her quietly. So all they know is this little girl who is now pregnant, who insists God did it. So what would everybody say? They would dismiss her as making up a story in order to cover her indiscretion. I think they're looting back. I think they're saying, isn't this Jesus, the firstborn son of Mary, the one who, you know what I'm talking about. And they bring up his legitimacy as a person to discredit who he is. Who he is. I have friends who are a part of blended families. I have friends who have brothers and sisters who were either had a wedlock or they were, just the circumstances of their birth were different. And oftentimes, things like this get used today in order to dismiss what someone has to say or dismiss the change in someone's life. And they take offense, just like they did here with Jesus. The word, by the way, is scandalon. It's where we get the word scandal. Jesus comes in, he creates a huge uproar. Little Jesus coming in, doing these things, scandal. Nothing you could say at that point would change their mind about him because they know little Jesus, they know who he is, they know what he knows, they know who he is, who he came from, all of and so forth so on and so forth. And they took offense. Probably because he spoke the truth. We go into our families and with our friends on holidays or wherever and we speak the truth. And that can sometimes create problems. And we're torn between, do I just not say anything? Or do I continue to hammer home the truth? Maybe they thought he lacked authority in their eyes. Or maybe, like many of us, I know this is what I deal with sometimes, I'm sure you do as well, they look at us hypocrites. I mean, I grew up, I was that kid. I was that kid. Like, if I grew up in this church, I would have been that kid. And I turned into eventually that adult. Then ended up becoming a drug addict, going to prison, all of that. Here's this guy. They know. They thought he was a hypocrite. Thought he was a hypocrite. You know, it's kind of interesting. I've seen something like this too in prison before. I would work with somebody. Someone would say, everyone called me Doc, by the way. Someone would say, Doc, tell me, you know, I have a question. And it would start with a simple question about theology or the Bible. Usually a very good, astute, deep question. And I would sit down with them and we'd begin to discuss what it meant or what I believed it meant. And they would say, I really, I get it. I'm starting to really understand this. And they'd ask more questions, and you could watch the Holy Spirit take in the, 
the blinders away. It was just so amazing right before me. And they would walk away, and I'd hear them go with their old group of friends. And he'd say something, and they would say invariably something, some riff on this. Oh, you think you're smart now. You think you're better than us. You think you got your life all figured out. Well, let me remind you where you are. You're in prison right now, just like me. So don't come at me with these lofty words and tales of truth. You're no different than me. And they would discount what he would say. Sadly, what often would happen is I would watch the the devil just come in and just pluck that guy out of the group, get him into a fight, someone he had never known come in and start interacting with them in a way that he just couldn't deal with at that time to get him away from, maybe, me and the word. Realize that people will judge you based on their previous knowledge of you. And this is sadly something that might never change. Frequently, I will talk to somebody about some situation that they're having with a loved one. And I know these people. I've interacted with them. I know their heart. I know their change. I know who they were to some extent, and I know who they are now. And they tell me stories. I say, I go to my mother, and I say X, Y, and Z, and the mother will have some horrific response that is completely incongruent with the initial conversation. Something just totally out of left field. And it will happen again and again. This is what I've come to realize. Is that oftentimes when I'm interacting with people, when I'm talking, when I'm counseling, and people are telling me stories about their engagement with their family, it's obvious their family is interacting with the old person. The context of all the bad choices, the context of what they knew, the context of who you were, what you said, all the hurts are influencing the interaction now, sometimes years after there's been a decided conversion and change in somebody's life. The frustration that I hear in people's voices, I don't know what to say to them, to make them believe I'm not who I was. Here's a short answer. There's nothing you can say. There's nothing you can say. Listen to what it says in verse 4. Jesus is very upfront. He says, a Jesus said to them, a prophet is not without honor except in his own town, among his relatives, and even in his own home. And he couldn't do any miracles there except lay hands on a few sick people and heal them. And he was amazed at their faith. Second principle for this morning, our dismissal by friends and family should not change who we claim to be. Should not change who we claim to be. We often seek, well, what do I say to get through to them, to make them know that I... It's the wrong question. The better question is, how do I best represent Christ in this situation? How do I best reflect the love of God to my friends and family, even though they might dismiss me? Jesus speaks directly to those who doubted them. He's not speaking to his disciples here. He's not speaking to us. He's speaking to those who discounted him. So what does he do? He calls himself a prophet. He leaned into the truth. He didn't say, well, no, you don't understand. I'm really just trying to do the best I can. He comes in, he says, a prophet is not without honor. He's saying, I am a prophet. He embraces the facts and he accepts the truth as it is. He's unapologetic. I am who I am. But he's also not resentful. It says they're amazed, he's amazed at their lack of faith, but there's no inclination that he has some sort of like axe to grind against them. We can do this in our interactions with people who dismiss who we are now based on who they knew us to be. You know, it's like, I see this sometimes, you can probably relate to this. I'll see this sometimes, like, I try everything, and they still dismiss me. So in response, they're dead to me. In an effort to protect one's own self and how you're being perceived, totally severed ties. We can't do that. That doesn't honor the Lord. God wants us to do the next right thing with our family each and every time and be a witness to Jesus as the primary purpose of our lives. I'm here to reflect God. I'm here to reflect the Lord. And how do I do that in a winsome and loving way? And he doesn't get quiet and say, you're right. Have you ever been in a situation with a family member or friend Or maybe someone here who you're dying to say what's on your mind. You're dying to say it. But you just don't because you know it's not the right thing. 
This is different than delivering truth than what, that God is calling you to deliver in a winsome, kind, and loving way. Sometimes we really want to beat people over the heads with the truth and we make matters worse for us with our family and friends. If you notice the concentric circles here, he says prophet's not without honor in his own town, in his own place, among his own people, in his own town or relatives, and in his own home. The closer we get to people, the harder it is to speak truth to them. Fact. Fact. I can prove this through every parent who has ever told their kids some statement of truth, who then denies it and comes back five minutes later from a YouTube video, says the exact same thing, and you're like, what did I just say? I goof around, but you know what I'm talking about. Because we did it ourselves, didn't we? we? We all did it ourselves. The closer we are to someone, it's often hardest to speak truth to them. Jesus' own family didn't believe them. Believe him. Don't be surprised when they don't believe you. God wants you to continue doing his will and living as a child of light and faith in the face of darkness and unbelief. You do you. God also desires that we do so with winsomeness and grace. That means we remember our own fallen state. We remember how blind we were. And we remember how kind the Lord was to delivering the truth to us in the way he did. We seek to do the same to those who love us. Third point, avoid asserting your faith where there is a persistent dismissal of what you believe. It does not help to double down on something that is driving somebody crazy in an effort to be right or speak the truth of the faith. It does not. This doesn't mean that we stop being who we are. I'll give you a for instance. I do a wedding and there's unbelievers or the people getting married. I'm not going to not say, God bless you, go in peace. I'm not going to say the purpose of marriage is God created it for this purpose, yet they might not believe a word that I say. The way we interact with people who discount us or discount what we believe is we continue to be who we are, we do so with love and grace, the way God showed us. It says Jesus was amazed at their lack of faith. They filtered his great words and miracles out of their assessment of him. They fixated on their history and prior knowledge of him instead of what they saw directly before him. Elsewhere, Jesus is amazed by others' faith in him based on their simple knowledge of his miracles or what they heard about him. Sometimes it's even hearsay, like I said. Someone, a Gentile, someone outside of the family of the Jewish faith comes and falls at the feet of Jesus and says, you can do anything. And they believe, and it says he was amazed at their faith. The centurion was amazed at the faith of the centurion. And yet his own people rejected him. Notice Jesus didn't condemn them. He didn't try to convince them. He didn't try to reason with them or debate them. Why? Because Jesus, better than anybody, knows the blinding nature of sin. That prior to God's revealing himself to us through a work of his grace by opening the eyes of our heart to see who he is, we were blind. I don't care if you were saved at four years old or or whatever, prior to your acceptance of the gospel, you were blind lost in your sin, an enemy and at enmity with God. But he broke through out of his grace and opened your eyes. We often forget this truth when we interact with loved ones and we say, no, it's not an it's an argument. It's an insistence. I will logically reason you into the kingdom, yet that's not what God did for us. And it has to be preceded by God's gracious opening of their eyes. Nevertheless, Jesus simply did what he could where he was. You know, we can damage a lot of relationships by pushing our faith where it's clearly not wanted. We can push people right away. We can ruin our witness. We could say the truth in such an unloving way that we never get the opportunity again because we've said something to hurt someone's feelings or with the wrong heart. Previous pastor here, and I were talking one time, and he said something that has just really stuck with me. He says, if you get mad, you've already lost the argument. Even if what you're saying is 100% correct, even if there's not angry words spoken, if you're already in a place of anger, it's over. It's over. Jesus does not get angry here. He's shocked. He's amazed. He wonders at their lack of faith. In their rather aggressive dismissal of him, yet still, he does not get angry. 
You don't want to ruin your next opportunity. And perhaps most importantly, you don't want to waste your time. You don't want to waste your time. In Matthew, Jesus says, Do not give dogs what is holy, and do not throw your pearls before swine, lest they trample them underfoot and turn to attack you. We don't consider and continue to give the things of the Lord to people who don't want it. Now, the important part of this verse, for some of you who, who this verse grates against, realize that at one time, you were a dog, you were a pig. <laughs> we were all dogs and pigs. And one day, God opened our eyes to see the truth. And we embraced who he was. People require a revelation of the truth by a prior act of God's grace. No number of convincing arguments, no number of good works, lofty words, or even miracles from heaven will convince people who don't want to believe. It must be revealed to the heart. It must be opened by their choice and God's grace. Finally, for this morning, fourth point, though dismissed, we must continue to, good, to do good wherever and to whomever we can. Last verse. Some Bibles put this verse at the beginning of the next section. I put it here at the end. Then Jesus went around teaching from village to village. Feels to me like he goes, he tries to give them their best, they reject him for who he is and what he was, and he does a few things, and he goes to the surrounding villages, maybe those who don't know him as well to do and to teach the things of God. If Jesus is amazed by their lack of faith, then I don't think we should be surprised by others' lack of faith. I think we should just recognize it as a fact and seek to work through it in order to bring them to a place of understanding, a place where we can interact with them without it being so aggressive, without it being so difficult. Jesus ministered wherever he could. He did not allow their lack of faith to impact his ministry. He, in, he interacted wherever faith was found, even in small ways. So when we're interacting with our friends and family this holiday season, really any day, look for ways that you can be a blessing to them without simply trying to convince them of who you are, who Jesus is, or what the truth is. In other words, don't try to sell something that people aren't buying. People aren't buying. We were on vacation in uh, Missouri. I don't know, when was that? A few months ago. We were laying around the pool. I haven't laid around a pool in a long time. It was glorious. And they were playing some music on their local radio station. And I was sort of just really relaxed, hanging, you know, listening. And there was like this sales, sales minute or salesman minute, something like that. And this person gets on and talks about, you know, as a salesperson, you should be happy when someone says no. You should celebrate the no's when you're trying to sell. Because what ends up happening is we say, someone says no to us and we see that as, oh, a challenge to overcome. We put all this time in and we hope to get them to a maybe at best. And in the end, they say no. All of the time and energy we invest in trying to pour into someone or you know, into a situation that does not want it could be invested on people who do. And there's plenty of people who do. There's plenty of people who do. Jesus did not die. I wrote this. I want to make sure this is theologically correct. I want to reread it again. because it... Jesus died for the very people who rejected him. It doesn't say that Jesus died for the whole world except those Nazarenes who were really jerks to him when he came back home. Jesus died for everybody. Our remembrance of that, our, when we interact with people and we realize that they're not buying what we're selling, it should not, we, we should not be in a place of rejecting them. That offer is still there. We need to make sure that we still open, keep those doors uh, open for communication. You know, I had to learn a really hard lesson when I came into ministry is that people, you all are on your own path with the Lord. Each and every one of you. And I have to allow God to do what he does with all of you with the people in my life. That can be frustrating. I just want to shake somebody. God has a plan for each and every one of us, including your friends and family who you love, those who are dismissing you, those who reject what you believe. The best we can do sometimes is to simply love them, be kind to them, pray for them, do good wherever you can, and be winsome in the process. 
So this holiday season, remember, friends and family sometimes use their knowledge of us to dismiss the knowledge in us. Our dismissal by friends and family should not change who we claim to be. We should avoid asserting our faith where there is a persistent dismissal of what you believe. And though dismissed, we must continue to do good wherever and to whomever we can. I don't know about your life, but there were plenty of times in my life when I rejected the Lord. I didn't want to hear what he said. I dismissed who he was. I dismissed everything I knew. I filtered all of the positives out in order to focus on the negative and stay in my state of disbelief. Some of us have friends and family who are there right now. We were there at one point. We were there. Yet God in his grace, because he loves us so much, would not allow us to just be gone and stay gone because it's really our sin that creates that separation. But he found a way to overcome. In fact, he had a plan from the beginning to overcome the very sin that created an obstacle between us and God, Jesus. Jesus came and died on the cross to absorb the penalty of our own sin so we could have open and complete interaction and relationship with God the God who created us, to be restored to who we were always intended to be with God. All we need to do in order to receive that is believe. The Bible makes it very clear. There's nothing we can do to do it on our own. We're lost. We're blind. God comes and tells us, this is what I've done through my son. What we do is embrace it by faith. And every promise in the scripture that says that we are saved, that we are freed from our sin, that we are released from the shackles of our flesh are brought to bear in our life through the death and life of Jesus Christ. Today's Communion Sunday, this is what we actually celebrate when we celebrate communion. It's a remembrance. It's something that we go back to each time and we sit before God and we reflect on who we were, what our state was before him, lost and blind, And that God, out of his love through the death of Jesus, made a way. Today we remember that way and we remember that sacrifice. So each of you will have received uh, one of these cups like this. There's a couple of layers. A top layer opens up and you get the bread. The bottom layer opens up and you have the juice. This is juice. What I want you to do as we sit here, is there anybody here who has not gotten a communion cup? If you have, raise your hand and we'll make sure that we... Uh, have Mr. McKendrick come around. What I want you to do as we go into the communion portion of today is I want you to reflect on who you were. I want you to think about how you were lost. I want you to consider your life now in ways that you're continuing to live like that. There may be something that the Lord is knocking on your heart with. God wants to talk to you about it. Maybe there's a sin in your life that you're having a hard time letting go of. Maybe there's a fear or a worry that just keeps ringing in your ears again and again. I want you to know that right now is the moment that you can sit before God and your brothers and sisters before we take this and have a conversation. If you need to confess with the Lord, confess right now. If you need to talk to God, if you need to thank God, now is your moment. And as the music begins, and as you sit and you spend your time in your own moment, I want you to take first the bread. The bread which represents his body, his life that was lived for us that we would receive the righteousness of God. Because he lived perfectly, God says we are perfect. And then secondly, the juice which represents his blood. It represents the sacrifice and the promise of something new, the new covenant. And I want you to thank him for who you now are and for what is to come by the promise of his word. And so allow me to pray for the elements before we begin. And we'll start. Father, we do thank you, Lord, for this day. We thank you, Lord, for the death of your son. We thank you, Lord, for the Holy Spirit who fills us all in this family who are united by him. We pray, Lord, for these elements, both the bread and the juice. And we pray, Lord, that you would drive these home by faith into our heart. Help us, Lord, to see who you are and who we are and help us to see what you have done. I pray, Lord, that you would meet each one of my brothers and sisters in a powerful way. In Jesus' name we pray. 
Pastor Adam here. Well, I want to thank you for tuning in to Grace Bible Church, and I would love to hear what you thought of today's program or of ways that we can be praying for you and with you. So check us out on social media at GBCL. Also, if you would like to support our ministry, you can give securely at our website at www.gbclm.org. Now remember, God loves you, and so do we.